Welcome to Chapter 12, Environmental Protection and Negative Externalities. Across the country, countless people have protested, even risking arrest, against the Keystone XL pipeline. President Trump has encouraged the building of the pipeline through executive order, saying that it would bring jobs and support growth in the economy. If we take a look at this issue and other similar issues through the lens of economics, it will help us understand that both sides have valued arguments that impact the entire economy and individuals and firms within the economy. In economics, we learn about markets, which is where buyers and sellers of goods and services meet and exchange goods and services for a negotiated price. The sellers or producers of a good or service supply the market with a good or service and receive the market price. If we subtract the cost of production from the price, we get the profit made by the producer. Buyers come to the market demanding goods and services and are willing and able to pay a certain price for what they want. This price they are willing and able to pay may be more or less than what the sellers are willing to sell for. If they cannot or will not pay the price sellers are willing to sell for, then they don't get the good or service. If they are willing and able to pay a, a higher price than the market demands, then they have a surplus. This is called the consumer surplus. Externalities, also called spillover, are the impacts that the market transactions have on others who are not part of the transaction. For example, if a farmer pays for a crop duster to spray insecticide on their crops, that is a market transaction. The externality comes when a beekeeper's bees are impacted by their insecticide. Perhaps others are impacted by this brain or insecticide as well. Who will pay the costs associated with the externalities? These costs are not part of the negotiated or original market price between the producer and the consumer. Externalities that are seen as additional costs to society for market transactions are called negative externalities. This type of externality includes things like pollution from factories, secondhand smoke from cigarettes, or sound pollution from a concert. Not all externalities are negative. In fact, there are many goods and services that have positive externalities. For example, a vaccination might benefit Others not vaccinated will benefit from a disease not spreading to them. Or honeybee operations that provide pollination to those not paying for the services. There might even uh, be positive externalities for those who do not pay for a concert, but benefit from hearing it from a distance. Let us take a look at how negative externalities affect supply and demand. The supply curve on the right represents the original private supply curve of the seller in the market and their associated costs. We see at point EO, the buyer and seller agree at a price. This is called equilibrium. This equilibrium has an associated equilibrium price of $650 and an equilibrium quantity of 45,000 refrigerators in the refrigerator market. Now let's say that there is pollution associated with the production of refrigerators that the producers of refrigerators do not pay for. If we accounted for these additional external costs of $100 for every unit produced, the firm's supply curve would be S social, or the curve on the left and the new equilibrium would occur at E1. This reduces the quantity in the market to 40,000 refrigerators and increases the equilibrium price to $700. Who pays the cost of the pollution associated with producing refrigerators? Society will most likely because the producers of refrigerators may not be willing to pay. One of the ways to control these negative externalities is through using command and control regulations. Simply put, these are regulations that make polluting 
or whatever causes the negative externality illegal. Sometimes these regulations may just mandate a fix for the negative externality that producers must comply with. Is this an effective way to limit negative externalities? Yes, they can be, but they may also have a negative impact on the operations of the free market. Here are some other more market-oriented tools to address negative externalities, like pollution. The first is a pollution charge, or a tax on the quantity of pollution that a firm emits. This works in terms of the cost-benefit analysis of reducing pollution versus paying the tax for polluting. Firms will invest in reducing pollution if the alternative, tax, is more expensive. Here is an example. This curve represents the marginal cost of reducing pollution by different amounts. If a pollution charge is set equal to $1,000, then the firm will have an incentive to reduce pollution by 30 pounds because the $900 cost of these reductions would be less than the cost of paying the pollution charge or tax. The second market-oriented environmental tool is a marketable permit program, also known as a cap-and-trade program. This type of program allows producers willing to pay more to pollute, to, buy, to be able to buy permits, which allows them to pollute. The upside is that those selling the permits will no longer be allowed to pollute because the pollution level is capped by the number of permits available and only so many permits exist. The final market-oriented environmental tool is a better defined property rights. This allows infringement on others' property by pollution or another negative externality to be compensated. This is done primarily through the court system, which protects all property rights from damage or infringements. When the quantity of environmental protection is low so that pollution is extensive, for example at quantity QA here on the graph, there are usually a lot of relatively cheap and easy ways to reduce pollution, and the marginal benefits or the extra benefits of doing so are quite high. At QA, it makes sense to allocate more resources to fight pollution. However, as the extent of environmental protection increases, the cheap and easy ways of reducing pollution begin to decrease, and more costly methods must be used. The marginal cost curve rises. Also, as the environmental protection increases, the largest marginal benefits are achieved first, followed by reduced marginal benefits. As the quantity of environmental protection increases, to say QB, the gap between marginal benefits and marginal cost narrows. At point QC, the marginal cost will exceed the marginal benefits. At this level of environmental protection, society is not allocating resources efficiently because too many resources are being given up to reduce pollution. Reducing pollution is costly. Resources must be set, uh, sacrificed. The marginal cost of reducing pollution are generally increasing because the least expensive and easiest reductions can be made first, leaving the more expensive methods for later. The marginal benefits for reducing pollution are generally declining because the steps that provide the greatest benefit can be taken first and the steps that provide the least benefit can wait until later. This is a production possibilities frontier which shows the trade-offs of a society who either chooses to maintain economic output on the vertical axis or protect its environment on the horizontal axis. Each society will have to weigh its own values and decide whether it prefers a choice like P with more economic output and less environmental protection or a choice like T with more environmental protection and less economic output. Either way, the society tries to avoid producing at points like M because that means that the economy is not producing at full capacity. Typically, the production possibilities frontier answers a couple of questions for us. First, what is the standard of living in a society? This is usually answered by the total output of the economy, but the quality of the environment can also impact the standard of living. Second, is a society balancing their present consumption and its investment in the future? The economy and the environment can work in harmony to answer this question as well.